Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Happy to be here with you. Early August 2022, a lot going on in the world and a lot always going on in the UFO world. Um, it's interesting, uh, in the coming uh, days or weeks, I will probably want to give a, a breakdown of a very interesting paper written by Hal Puthoff dealing with ultra terrestrials. Uh, I'm not going to do that here. Uh, I've got something that I want to talk about that's, that's somewhat related, uh, surprisingly, to what uh, Dr. Puthoff had written about. Uh, and this is actually a presentation that I developed a few days ago for my website, Richard Dolan Members. Uh, dot com. Uh, a lot of times I will I will try out my first lecture uh, version on my website because I get great feedback from so many of the people there. A lot of very, very smart, insightful people who will uh, provide feedback on a lot of the, um, the podcasts and articles and things that I write there. So that happened here. So I gave a presentation a few days ago dealing with UFO behavior and trying to make sense out of that behavior. Uh, really trying to get kind of behind behind the eyes, behind the the motivations of whoever these operators of these UFOs are, aliens, presumably, and uh, trying to make sense out of the behavior of these objects. So uh, what I've done here is essentially providing a, a similar lecture to what I gave, uh, but with a little more of an em emphasis on the alien abduction element of it, which I think is really quite prominent, and that's why I've included that in the title here. So this is the uh, the lecture. I'm calling it UFO Behavior and Abductions. And I want to jump right in. Nice picture of some zebras there. Wonderful creatures. Uh, I could have used any animal. The thing is, when we when we watch animals in the wild, we've gotten to a point where we've got a very good understanding of their behavior. We understand, you know, you're trying to avoid predators or capture prey or find a mate or get food in some way. Uh, animal behavior, we pretty much understand it. The exception being my cat that I've never been able to understand what goes through her mind. But other than that, I think we've got a pretty good handle on animal behavior. But what we don't understand well, what we frequently find baffling, is the behavior of UFOs. Um, you know, think about how you uh, encounter a UFO, or how most people do. Uh, it's brief, it's often by accident. Uh, it's, you know, a couple of seconds and then shoo, they're gone. Uh, and many times we're mystified by what we see. Now, it's not always the case. There have been incidences where, of course, uh, UFOs have been seen over, you know, connection with military activities, nuclear installations and the like. And it's not difficult to infer their motivations. They're presumably interested in what, what the humans are up to, what's the latest uh, technology that they're they're working on and so forth. But a lot of the behaviors that we see are not easy for us often to figure out. We're, we're left baffled. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But, but first, let's talk about where UFOs uh, occur. And I mean, the, the, <laughs> the spoiler alert is that they happen everywhere. UFOs are everywhere. They're in deep space. Uh, I've, I've written about this in one of my books in particular, I think volume two of UFOs in a national security state. I talked about one military witness, a uh, person whose records uh, I was able to look at. She allowed me to and talked about um, very, very, uh, the fact that she got in trouble by looking at uh, being exposed to NORAD, uh, a memo that talked about NORAD being able to track elements or objects coming in from deep space into Earth orbit. These were artificial objects. These were not natural things. Uh, really made life difficult for her. This is in the early 1980s. And um, she's uh, completely legit in my view. But we've had a lot of evidence showing UFOs being tracked in Earth orbit. Uh, again, I wrote about this in one of my books. There's a, a satellite known as the DSP, Defense Satellite Program. These are geosynchronous satellites designed to detect missile launches and the like. But they're also very good at detecting UFOs. And we know of uh, instances in which, at least in one case in the 1980s, a UFO came in, parked about three miles from a DSP satellite for a short while, and then took off. Um, so they're all throughout space. They're all throughout Earth orbit. 
they're all throughout Earth's skies and atmosphere. We know this. They're seen everywhere. They're recorded everywhere, over every continent and every body of water. They are everywhere. We've seen them very low over the ground. We've seen them over rivers. We've seen them over people's homes. Uh, this is something that I've been talking about quite a bit lately, the fact that these objects are being seen by people at two, three in the morning, four in the morning, 200 feet over someone's home, over a residential neighborhood. What are they doing? Sometimes shining a beam of light down. Quite a few of these reports exist. You go to the National UFO Reporting Center. I'm a big fan of that site. And you can read these types of reports frequently enough. It happens enough that it's clearly a pattern. So um, that's just one of the things that they do. They've been seen in bodies of water. They've been seen coming out of bodies of water. We're talking large oceans to lakes, to rivers, and even swamps. They have been alleged to be underground. I tend to credit uh, at least some of those claims. They are, in fact, everywhere. UFOs are everywhere. What they also, uh, what this means is that if you're one of these beings that are operating these craft, you, you probably know planet Earth better than almost any human can possibly. This is a picture of Antarctica. Uh, I've never been to Antarctica. Most, most of you have probably not been to Antarctica, but they could go if they wanted. If you had a flying saucer that could rapidly and instantly take you safely to that location, maybe you would go uh, for a short while just to check it out for whatever reasons. You could go and hover over the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You could go to the Amazon rainforest instantly instantly at any of these places. You want to look at the Himalayas, go right ahead, and so on and so on. So it would allow you to know our world better than nearly any human being that I can imagine, right? Uh, also, you would have the ability to measure, I would assume, uh, or record uh, to a far greater, more accurate capability than what we human beings are able to do. So you would you would have better data to work with. You would have a better understanding of many of the processes on planet Earth than humans do. Interesting to keep in mind. Uh, when we ask another question, how many UFOs are there? How many aliens are there? Look, we don't really have a way of understanding the answer to that. We, we can't know. Uh, I have frequently tried to discuss how many sightings, good sightings, there happen to be around the world every year. And the truth is, and I have bemoaned this and belabored this point for years now, but it's important. The, the truth is we do not have a good uh, global infrastructure in place by which we can have a really good measurement of that. We have, uh, I just mentioned the National UFO Reporting Center a short while ago. We have that website. We have the MUFON website. They take in UFO reports mostly from North America. They Both of them will take reports from other parts of the world. But I mean, realistically, they are, you know, predominantly getting reports from North America. They're English language websites. It's just, it's a lot more uh, normal for them to get the reports. So extrapolating out to how many sightings around the world is, is not easy to do, but I've tried. And when you, you know, you look at the MUFON database, you look at the New Fork database, that's 5,000 at least a year, not a lot of overlap, talking at least 10,000 raw reports from those two citing uh, websites alone. Uh, there are other sources as well. Let's just say 10,000 reports a year. Obviously, they're not all legit uh, alien sightings. What What is the percentage? I don't know. People like to debate this. Sometimes they'll I have a very low percentage and sometimes they'll have a higher percentage. When I go through these raw reports, I will say they are stronger than you think. They haven't been subjected, most of them, to genuine investigation. There's just not enough resources to do it. But when you just read the details that are provided, they're quite compelling. Uh, I would encourage any of you to go to the National UFO Reporting Center and just peruse what he's got there. Uh, so. In fact, I, I would suggest that there are more good sightings out there than we're willing to recognize. On top of that, how many people see UFOs that they never report? We know that number is extremely high, at least a factor of 10. And then how many uh, people who, uh, how many UFOs are out there that we don't notice? 
we we have no way of knowing, but it's got to be a lot. I mean, when you think about the conditions that most of us see UFOs, again, it's almost by accident most of the time. It's quick. It's unexpected. They clearly, most of the time, do not want to be seen. Sometimes they may, but most of the time they don't want to be seen. And they are elusive. And yet we do see them. So, you know, all in all, I think what we're talking about is a potentially very, very large presence of, of, uh, of these beings and of activity and craft that are out there. Um, I estimate that this could easily be a case of a thousand or more trips around somewhere in the world every day by these objects. You may think that's ridiculously high amount, but that's of course nothing compared to our airline industry, uh, which is vastly, vastly more than that. A uh, thousand or 2000 or 3000 or even more per day. When I go through the numbers, I don't think that that is an outrageous uh, number at all. And, you know, if, if you say a thousand trips per day, so that would be, um, you know, or over 365,000 per year. But again, uh, it's not, it's not an impossibility, not an impossibility at all. But, you know, if it, that's the amount, then you have to ask like, how many craft are they operating? Is it two? Is, is one craft just doing all of this or there, is there a fleet? And you could figure out your own numbers, plug in this the way that you want. But uh, I think what we're looking at is a minimum, many, many thousands of beings operating these craft every day. Uh, on top of that, there have to be many, many thousands more to provide support functions and so forth. Um, a lot of these craft are clearly not manned, if we can use that word, they're not inhabited. Uh, maybe half of them are, we don't, again, we don't know. Some, some of them clearly are, some of them don't seem to be, but uh, I'm just discussing this here to, to give you a sense that we are very likely talking about an enormous amount of activity. And again, I don't want to belabor this, but let me just make this point again. Uh, it is very, very possible that um, North America has minimum of 5,000 really good UFO sightings every year. That's just sightings per year. Um, that's my conclusion. Uh, but on top of that, I would multiply by 10 to, um, to say, you know, how much activity is not detected. And you know, that could easily give you 50,000 uh, UFO events in North America per year. And then of course, North America being just 5% of the world's population, you know, multiply by 20 to get some global number. And that's, that's what I'm talking about here. So I think it is entirely possible that we're dealing with a large number of these, these uh, craft and, and beings. So I think, you know, it's just something that we have not really genuinely come to terms with, but I think we need to. On top of that, let's talk about abductions now, uh, which is part of the title of this talk. How many abductions take place? You know, abduction statistics are notoriously scanty. Uh, we, we just really don't know, but there have been some attempts to figure this out. And one of them, probably the most famous attempt, happened about 30 years ago. It was in 1992, something called the Roper Pole. This was actually developed by two of the leading abduction researchers at that time, Bud Hopkins and Dr. David Jacobs, uh, developed this. I'm not sure if John Mack was involved in this one at all, but, uh, but Bud Hopkins and Dave Jacobs definitely were. And what they tried to do is they developed um, a, a survey by which they included very carefully uh, questions that would signify to them uh, that this person might actually be an alien abductee. Uh, in other words, qualities that they were aware of in their research that alien abductees seem to share, uh, they would include that in there uh, to give themselves a sense of, okay, how many people uh, have had this. And I, I'm really not doing good justice to how they devised this, but I, it seems to me that they did a, a really good, honest, um, and well thought out effort to, to do that. 
and they hired the Roper Company, which is a major polling company, to conduct this poll. The results were really quite shocking, which is that as many as 2% of the population could be alien abductees. 2%, that's one out of 50. That's a lot of people. Now, you could say that's ridiculously high. Maybe it is. But I would, I will just say that uh, in my own experience, talking to people who have had apparent abductions, I've talked to quite a few, quite a few. Um, n- almost none of them are famous. Uh, for every Travis Walton, uh, there are a thousand or more, um, thousands of more people who have had what seem to be similar experiences, abduction experiences. There's a lot of them out there. They're not looking for publicity for the most part. And uh, they are frequently very troubled by what they went through. Or if not troubled, then they're just kind of mystified. But what is clear is that there's a larger number of people out there who have had apparent abductions than our society is willing to recognize or even often the UFO research community really discusses. I think it's quite a bit out there. So um, it may not be 2%. It may not be 1 out of 50, but it could be 1%. Would not would not shock me. Uh, and even if it's a half percent, that's still millions of people. That's still a lot of people. So if you if you go on the 2% number, let's just do that for the sake of argument here. That would, in today's United States, where there's more than 300 million people, that would presumably equal 6 million Americans alone that have had an abduction experience if you go by 2%. If you were to take that number and let's say amortize it out, in other words, uh, not all the abductions are happening at the same time. They're happening over the course of a lifetime, right? Um, We'll just say, let's just say one person gets one abduction, even though we know that's not often the case. But that would mean at least 75,000 abductions a year. Um, if you want to get up to 6 million, that, that's more than 200 abductions a, every day. It, could this be, could this be true? I, I mean, I don't know if it's true, but it, it could be. It, it all depends on how much credence you want to put in, in the Roper poll uh, methodology. Um, and if not the Roper poll, again, you know, we're left with trying to get a sense, sometimes anecdotally, admittedly, of how widespread is the abduction phenomenon. And my own uh, conclusion, at least for now, is that it's pretty widespread, quite widespread. And there's a lot of them. And so here's, here's what I'm trying to, this is my point here. If you have a lot of abductions, potentially many abductions happening, do we have enough UFO activity that could account for such an, a large number of abductions? And I think the answer is yes, which is really what I've been trying to get at here. Um, I don't think it's an outrageous possibility that you could have 50,000 uh, or more UFO trips in the U.S. per year which would actually get you in the ballpark of large numbers of abductions that could account for such a massive operation. Now, again, the numbers could be lower. Uh, It could be 10,000 UFO trips per year, accounting for maybe 50 abductions a day. Maybe it isn't 250 abductions a day. Maybe it's just 50 a day. But my point is simply that we seem to have a lot of abduction activity happening, and we definitely are seeing a large amount of UFO activity. So that I think if someone is doubtful that so many abductions could occur, I would suggest that, no, I think the, I think the proper way to look at these UFO numbers and st- sightings and statistics is that they are more than capable of accounting for large numbers of abductions, which is really, you know, if I have a a major thesis for this talk, it might be just that it's very easy for us to conclude, which I think that I do provisionally here, that a large amount of UFO activity is related to alien abduction. I basically had a very long-winded way of making this one point. A lot of the UFO behavior that we observe, I do think, is related to the phenomenon of alien abduction. Not all of it, not all of it. Um, for example, I mean, a lot of it, I think, is uh, deals with military encounters, for example. This is a, a quotation that I 
came across. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Filer's Files, run by George Filer, retired U.S. Air Force major. He's still going. George is still putting out uh, weekly newsletters on the UFO subject. And uh, quite a few years ago, he had one uh, gentleman who wrote to him uh, by the name of Joseph Foster, who was a, a UFO witness from the Vietnam War era from back in 1970. He wrote about that. And then he uh, stated after the fact, um, he said, I went to Honolulu, uh, still in the Navy. And he said, I spoke with a, a fleet intelligence yeoman. So I don't know how high level this person was, but the yeoman just was speaking to him about UFO reports. He said, we received thousands of UFO reports from U.S. Navy ships. UFOs come in and out of the water and fly directly in front of our ships. Thousands. Now, you know, I, I mentioned this and one of the folks on my website said, look, I, I think that's just some some guy talking smack. He's cannot possibly be that they get thousands of UFO reports, uh, Navy reports. Uh, well, I mean, I will, I don't really know. Uh, it's, it is the, the case that we don't have thousands of U S Navy UFO reports. And this guy was saying it back in 1970, that there were thousands of, of UFO reports coming to the U S Navy, but could he have just been exaggerating? Could he have just been using a figure of speech? I mean, it's entirely possible. I think his main point here was that there were a lot of them. There were many, many UFO reports that the Navy uh, was making and recording in 1970 and thereabouts. And I'm willing to believe that for sure. Uh, it would indicate that there are many, many UFO encounters that are that we don't know about, ordinary people don't know about. Now, are, were all of those related to abduction? I'm going to guess, no, absolutely not. I'm sure many of them were not. So let's talk about what might they be doing. What are some of the motivations that these beings would have in doing anything whatsoever? Well, an obvious one that people have talked about for 80 years now, basically, is that they're here to study Earth. They're studying the inhabitants of Earth. They're uh, you know, back in the 1950s, people like Donald Kehoe uh, speculated that <clears throat> these aliens have just arrived. They're checking us out. They're doing a surveillance of the Earth and so forth. Uh, it could be that there is a study uh, scientific element to what they are doing. I, I would not rule that out. I would suggest, however, that the vast amount of activity that seems to be going on would be far, far more than just uh, passive studying Earth and its inhabitants. It seems to be much more involved in that. Another possibility is a second bullet point here, that they're interested in resources. You know, human beings are interested in resources. Uh, these are uh, presumably they, like us, were apex predators of their environment. Uh, they're used to getting their way, undoubtedly. I'm sure that in their world, they're used to dominating their global environment, just like human beings are used to dominating our global environment. So maybe they're interested in resources. Uh, we have many reports of these objects being interested in water, actually literally sucking water out of lakes uh, at times. We've gotten a number of reports like this. And also, you know, minerals. It, it's entirely possible that they have the ability to construct anything they want using, who knows, advanced nanotechnology, I don't know, with AI, and there may be endless possibilities. But I would never rule out the fact that they might find it attractive to engage with certain minerals that Earth has. Earth is a mineral-rich world, and there is a lot here that could be much more convenient for them to extract than if they have to manufacture all of that stuff. I don't know, but it's entirely possible. On top of that, although there are other worlds that are rich in minerals, maybe they're not all equally convenient uh, to work with. Pluto might have a lot of minerals for all I know, but it's a big block of ice. Maybe even for super intelligent aliens operating on the surface of or under Pluto might be a bit of a hassle that they would like to avoid. Ditto with a planet like Venus, which is boiling hot on the surface. Maybe they're thinking, ah, we don't really want to do that. But Earth, Earth is nice. It's temperate. You've got living creatures there. Um, yeah, let's go take some resources from Earth. That is not difficult for me to envision. 
uh, and also genetic resources. I mean, Earth is an absolute bonanza of incredible genetic biological diversity, clearly. And if you've got the ability to manipulate genetic material, Earth would be a very, very interesting place for you to go to. So I do think that, that um, that's a definite legitimate thing that they are interested in here. Um, some more benign uh, interpretations might just mean that they're here to just find a place to uh, to rest, to chill out between other stops, you know, a way station. Well, we're just here for a little while. We'll, we'll make a permanent base in the Himalayas, and uh, this is a place to get some good R&R. &R. Uh, I don't think that that's it, <laughs> but that's one possibility. Or is it something more invasive? that they're here for? Do they want to have a permanent presence here? Do they want to live here? Do they want to, uh, do they want to deal with humanity in a way that they control humanity? Uh, after all, human beings, uh, other than them, we're the dominant uh, predatory species on the planet. And it's, it is a necessity to ask, are we in their way? If they are here on this planet, they like this planet, are we in their way? Now, ask yourself this, which of the possibilities that I've either presented here or that you can think of yourself that would require a massive global presence by them? You know, something in which they're flying hundreds or even thousands of, of uh, sorties every day somewhere on the planet. What would require that? And also what would require their uh, virtual complete secrecy from the rest of humanity in their operations? Why would they need or why would they desire total secrecy? Uh, you could say, well, it's the humanity itself. We're so violent. We're so aggressive. Uh, they, there's no way that they could openly um, communicate with human beings without us just freaking out or wanting to kill them. That's a possibility. We are, uh, to put it mildly, a very assertive, aggressive species. That's right. But is it is that really it? Are they that afraid? Maybe they are, but maybe there's something else going on with all that secrecy as well. Um, best case scenario, you could maybe hypothesize is that they're here, and we've heard we've heard them say this to abductees and contactees from time to time that they are interested in Earth's life forms. They're afraid that mankind is uh, going to do is in the process of doing terrible things to deplete the Earth's ecosystem or damage the Earth's ecosystem, and they are interested in preserving uh, the life forms here on Earth. Uh, less than a year ago on my website, I did a, a multiple part breakdown of the abduction case of Betty Andreessen, a very famous and fascinating um, um, case, I guess we could say. And that's, that's kind of what she reported that they said to her that they're afraid that human beings are going to extinguish themselves and they are interested in preserving our genetic material, essentially. So that's that would be the most benign uh, instance. But I would have a question. If, if that's the case, why have they not, you know, and I'm sure you've wondered this too, why have they not made an open plea to humanity if they're that worried about us just going under due to our own folly, our own foolishness, our own aggression? Um, and if they found us to be worth saving, you know, is, is this prime directive? Like you must not interfere. Is that an absolute thing that they would never just say, make themselves known to us and say, hey, human beings, you're really on a bad path here. Let's help you out a little bit. Well, they haven't done that. Like not even, not even a little bit. So it makes me wonder about this thesis that they're, they're definitely concerned for our well-being and our survival. Maybe they are. Uh, they haven't really done a whole lot in, or anything, in my view, to ensure that we're not going to uh, blow ourselves to smithereens or destroy our planet. Maybe they're just still waiting for the moment. So uh, back to UFO behavior. So when you see a UFO, you know, what is it? what is it doing? What is this UFO doing? So I've got a couple of different scenarios and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So one situation is you see a UFO high up in the sky and it's moving fast and that's very common. Or you could see it's sometimes high in the sky and it's just hovering there. 
It's, it's motionless, but it's way, way up there. What is that? Uh, there are cases where we see UFOs hovering low over the ground. There are cases where we see UFOs hovering low over people's homes. There are cases of them entering or leaving bodies of water or uh, interacting with military in you know, one way or another. These are, these are just five situations, and there are others. Uh, I'm leaving it at this for now, and let's just go through them. Uh, and I'm just, you know, here all I'm doing is providing some possible theories and explanations that make sense to me. You may have something that you think of that I haven't thought of. Wouldn't shock me in the least. I don't pretend that what I've got to say is comprehensive here. But let's talk about uh, objects moving at high speed and high altitude. Obviously, my first assumption is you see something doing that. It is in transit from one point to another point. Um, I, I suspect that what you have is a situation where these objects and the beings that operate them have assignments. It could be you have a daily or weekly assignments from your supervisor. You know, your employer says to this one crew, okay, uh, I want you to go, you're going to go to St. Louis uh, today and you're going to abduct this woman here. She's been a lifelong abductee. We're going to take her again, check her out. And they're like, okay. And they're zipping along and someone in I don't know, Omaha, Nebraska sees them zipping on their way to St. Louis. All right. To me, that's an entirely possible scenario. There may be other ways to explain that, but that's, that is one because again, I'm trying to incorporate the likelihood that many abductions are taking place. So I think that is a significant motivator for a lot of the UFO activity. Now, it could be something unrelated to abductions altogether. Maybe there's one base in the Pyrenees and they're going to another base in the Himalayas or a base uh, under the Atlantic Ocean or wherever. Sure, that could account for some of these high-flying, fast uh, sightings that people will have. Or if they're simply hanging out uh, for a short period of time, there might be some kind of scientific or monitoring process that they are doing. Uh, it could be a surveillance of the population that they are doing. There, there's a number of those types of possibilities there. So now, hovering low over the ground. Well, that's a little easier, I think, to speculate about. Uh, you're driving along the road and you see an object right in front of you on the road. We've got many... Um, We've got many stories and accounts of such an event, and nearly all of them lead to some kind of abduction experience, from Betty and Barney Hill in 1961 to countless other cases where people are driving along the road, they see a, a landed or low object, and they have an hour or more of missing time and uh, an abduction experience, yes. So I think that's one thing, you know, they're waiting for humans to abduct or they're doing something else. Uh, there are cases of these landed craft or low over the ground where they're interested in extracting local resources, whether plants or um, often plants or even small animals. Uh, we've heard stories of, of this sort. So they're interested in the life that is on earth. Uh, low over people's homes, this is something that I just think is so important and is so seldom discussed in the UFO research community, but I think this is a significant part of the UFO phenomenon. And obviously, you know, visualize yourself going slowly over a neighborhood at an altitude of 200 feet. It's very low. It's very low indeed. Uh, just creeping quietly over homes. What else could you be doing than seeking to interact with, with someone in that neighborhood in the dead of night? Is that an abduction going on? Well, I don't see why not. I think that's a very reasonable uh, conclusion. Or are they all physical abductions? Is there some kind of mental manipulation going on, psychotronic technology or weaponry even being used on people. I don't know. But you know, 30 years ago, there was an abduction researcher named Carla Turner, who herself, she speculated on this very possibility. And her attitude, she actually came up with the phrase virtual reality scenarios. Virtual reality in 1991, 92, she's using this uh, phrase. She might have been the first person 
who started talking about virtual reality at all. Uh, Carla Turner was discussing this in the context of at least some potential alien abduction encounters, that there is this kind of mental manipulation that was going on, a virtual reality. Um, maybe that's what happens with some of these apparent abduction scenarios. Are they all physical in which someone is leaving their bedroom? Well, sometimes it may not be the case. I think, I think some of the uh, abduction stories look like that to me. Now, what would be the purpose of not physically taking someone, but just getting into their head? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I do think that this is a possibility. Uh, there could be other reasons why they're hovering low over people's homes at three in the morning, but I haven't I haven't been able to figure it out. There's some maybe another reason, some reason that would require them to do a careful monitoring in your neighborhood at three in the morning. I don't know what that would be. To me, some kind of abduction activity is the most uh, reasonable conclusion I can come to. Uh, bodies of water. Now that's very interesting. Again, I pointed out. I've, I've just done a breakdown of um, probably probably close to 100 USO reports uh, since the 1940s uh, over at my website, and they are just fascinating cases. Uh, clearly, if there's an object being seen moving at multiple hundreds of knots uh, speed under the water, which we don't have anything that can go that, those speeds, are they operating at a base below the oceans? I, I'm starting to think that there must be alien bases deep within the oceans, um, under the ocean floor, or maybe in an ocean mountain, uh, something like along those lines, entirely possible. Um, particularly, you know, when we have reports of these objects leaving uh, large bodies of water, I, I really just often wonder what, the heck are they doing there? Maybe one thing that they're doing is studying uh, a Navy vessel or some kind of other seafaring vessel that gets their interest. That's entirely possible, but I suspect that there are bases down there. Now, when you see reports of objects entering rivers or reservoirs, there's a lot of these, many, many of these reports people will uh, state, you know, I was out fishing uh, with my buddy or with my wife and it's it's late at night and we saw an object come out of the water, scared us, scared the heck out of us. Uh, there are such reports like this. I can't think that there's permanent base in some, you know, tiny New Jersey reservoir, for example. But I could imagine that objects will enter these bodies of water temporarily. Maybe it's a, a, a secure place to do their work for a few hours or uh, to, you know, complete one other. Maybe there's an abduction and they're, they're like, OK, this is a safe place for us to go. Now, that's not a full explanation because you get a lot of these UFO cases where they're seen over bodies of water, not necessarily in bodies of water. And the question then is, well, what are they doing over bodies of water? And there are instances where they're seen over these bodies of water by many witnesses. So they're not, they're not uh, passing the test of being stealthy here. Um, and the, the truth is, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know how to describe the motivations or the behaviors there. There's a lot about this phenomenon that the fact is we just do not know. Um, now, when they're examining a military base or when we have military encounters with these, or if they're seen over nuclear installations and the like, and this has happened in the United States, it's happened, we know for a fact, in the old Soviet Union. It is, uh, it's happened in a number of cases where UFOs are seen over um, nuclear technology locations or other important military bases or scientific sites or even oil fields and, and things like that. So I think when we, we get these types of cases where these are easy to understand, you know, they're interested in our technology, they're interested in what we can do and very, very possibly to assess potential threats. Why wouldn't they? Particularly if they have a global abduction program going on, one of the things that you'd expect that they would need to do is assess the military capabilities of the world's major nations and the mo world's most powerful nations militarily. So I think that's not an uh, outrageous way to understand why they would be examining 
uh, U.S. military uh, sites or Russian or Soviet military installations, and in all likelihood, Chinese as well. Uh, getting information in terms of the UFO phenomenon out of China is tricky. Uh, it's not an open society, but there is a lot of UFO research going on in China. And I am aware of at least alleged uh, UFO crash retrievals that have been said to occur in China in uh, the late 20th century. Don't know if it's true. Uh, this came from Dr. Sun um, Shili, I believe his name is, leading Chinese UFO researcher. Maybe it's true. But I think, you know, it's diff it's easy to see why they would be interested in our military tech. Uh, that's, that's simply all that I would say here. So, you know, when I, I look at the different types of scenarios, what activities best explain their behavior, the behavior of these objects? I think abductions goes top of the list. I think that best explains the reasons we see UFOs doing the many things that we see them do. Uh, I believe it is most reasonable to assume that it is connected with the abduction phenomenon in one way or another. Other possibilities <laughs> would include ongoing collection of materials that, you know, like that would be a, a necessary kind of year after year effort. Uh, we can call it a longitudinal study. Uh, maybe this explains, uh, you know, ongoing abductions in the sense, maybe they're just checking you over, uh, looking at your ep the epigenetics about, you know, how your, uh, your biological realities have changed over the last five years, maybe due to environmental impacts. Maybe they're doing some kind of uh, longstanding study. Maybe they're looking at the decline of human fertility. Uh, that's a real possibility. They, they might be looking at a lot of different things from a scientific perspective. That's definitely possible. Uh, or some other kind of low-key, I call it low-key monitoring effort. Um, would that explain their massive amount of activity that seems to be occurring. I don't think that that low key monitoring effort would really be easily uh, a way to explain everything that we've seen. I do think abductions or uh, is the number one explanation and perhaps uh, an ongoing resource extraction or research uh, into our resources year after year would explain it as well. Uh, getting close to wrapping this up here. There's a couple of questions that are absolutely necessary for us to understand before we really make a full determination of what's going on. And, and I think the number one thing has to do with abductions themselves. Uh, are abductions good or bad is a simple way to put, put it. In other words, uh, is it part of uh, the, you know, an alien hybridization uh, program to create human looking hybrid aliens that are going to insert themselves into human society for a, a takeover. This is the thesis of Dr. David Jacobs. He's talked about this for years and years. Could that be true? Are, are there more benign explanations of alien abduction uh, to the extent that, you know, there you have other abduction researchers who believe that there are more benign motives. Uh, that they are here to elevate humanity, to bring us to the, a higher level of consciousness so that we're not aggressive and violent and murderous uh, species, but that we can actually play nice in the sandbox with other species. Is that what they're trying to do? Um, I don't think that that's the case. That is not my opinion, but there are people who believe it, and I'm not going to rule out, uh, at least not in the context of this lecture here, uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, I think, again. But I do think we need to have a, a handle on the nature of abductions. And is this something that human beings need to be concerned about? The fact is, it seems to be a massive operation that is done in secrecy. So right off the bat, it, if nothing else, abductions need to get our attention as something that needs to be studied. It needs to be understood. It's something that is, I think, increasingly when you look at it, that is the number one reason behind all the UFO activity we've seen, that we see in the world around us, and that is very, very massive itself. And it's 
It's secret by them and it's secret within our own society. We don't talk about it. To me, this is a, a serious oversight by the UFO research community and by our society in general. Uh, another unresolved matter is how many distinct groups are operating here? I haven't even gotten into that in this talk. I've talked about this elsewhere, but is it just one group of aliens? Are they all under one unified command? Or are there multiple groups of non-human civilizations that are here interacting with us? Uh, I personally think the answer is more than one. And, you know, well, let me get back to that in just a second. So what I would say is no matter how many groups that there are, it is, an, to me, a very, very high probability that we're talking about UFO activity being strongly connected to alien abductions and alien encounters, let us say. And that this appears to be a massive operation. So what's a plausible scenario? Uh, I'll throw out a couple of bullet points here for you. A, I think multiple groups are here. I talked about this in my, my most recent book. I call the Alien Agendas. That's agendas plural, because I do believe that there are multiple groups with multiple agendas here. Um, I think they're here in large numbers now for the very simple reason that our own development has gone hyperbolic, I mean, beyond exponential. So we're becoming very, very interesting and very powerful very quickly. And I think that's bringing in the galactic neighborhood, so to speak. But at least one of the groups that is here is operating these UFOs, these flying saucers on a massive scale. Could be multiple groups, but definitely one, at least one is doing a tremendous amount of activity around the world. And that group is abducting a large number of people, a very large number of people, probably millions of people around the world is being taken. And it could be many millions for all we know, but certainly it's a large number. Now, the abduction process, you might say, is a good thing or is a bad thing, but it's, a, it's without a doubt an important thing. And it is being done in extreme secrecy. And this is, I think, an important point to make here. Other groups that are here, it seems to me, it's one of three things. They're either okay with all of this going on, they're fine with it, or they choose not to stop it, or they can't stop it. Uh, because what's going on is it's not being stopped. So even if there are multiple groups here and only one of them is doing abductions, they're, they're doing it and they're not being prevented from doing it for whatever reason, but they are not being prevented. They are going on. Um, one thing that I just, you know, this is as a result of me completing um, my little project on USOs recently. I, you know, I think there are almost certainly undersea bases and that this gives a very good uh, insight probably into just one more reason why the military, in particular in this case, the US Navy, would be very, very tight-lipped about the UFO phenomenon. If they are aware, I mean, we can assume they've mapped the entire ocean floor. They probably would know where these bases are. They certainly encounter high-speed USOs with apparent some regularity. And I think there's a reasonably good possibility that they know where a few of these bases are in the oceans. And that would be a matter of extreme uh, classification, without a doubt. And it would not be something that would just willy-nilly be discussed. It makes it very interesting, by the way, when we now talk about you know, the latest iteration of the UF, UAP task force, they are talking about uh, UFOs as transmedium objects. That is objects that can go into bodies of water, come out of bodies of water and go into the atmosphere. That's transmedium. And there is some opening in the uh, public conversation dealing with USOs, underwater UFOs. And I think that that's a very interesting development. We're going to want to clearly monitor that carefully. I'm not of the opinion that we're going to see any breakthroughs in the discussion on this, but I have to say it's very interesting that this is now being considered part of the equation in our public discourse. So to go uh, continue on to uh, the plausible scenario, um, all of the above that I've just mentioned would suggest that the UFO activity 
that we see anywhere in the world is purposeful. It is not random. There's intelligence behind it, and that intelligence can be not completely explained, but but in large measure explained by the fact that at least one group is doing all this activity with the with the um, primary goal of abducting human beings and then returning those human beings. Undoubtedly, there are other goals which might be aligned with abduction or subservient to abduction, but abduction is, I, you know, this is where I'm at now in my uh, understanding of the UFO phenomenon is that abductions are really a front row center element. And the ultimate question, and this is really where I'm gonna probably end this here. We need to come back to the all important question, why are human beings being abducted? Why do they get taken? That is, that is a very, very important question to ask. Why are human beings taken? There are a couple of potential answers, uh, which you know I've mentioned already here, but we really want to explore this over and over again. And you know, I just um, I'm going to I'm going to say this here: there are abduction researchers or uh, people studying UFOs who absolutely do not believe that abductions happen, or that if they happen, that they're negative. Uh, there's a, a fairly substantial contingent of researchers out there who ha have this opinion. And I guess I just have to say, I do not share that opinion. I do think that there are many abductions. I'm not saying they are all uh, negative. They don't all appear to be negative, at least in the assessment of the people who are experiencing them. But it must be said that many of them are perceived as in extremely negative by the people who've gone through the process. And I, I find it really um, arrogant, frankly, and presumptuous for a lot of researchers to say, and I've heard this, uh, they'll say to the abductee, well, you don't really understand what these beings are doing. It's just like an animal in the wild that's afraid when it's tagged by a human, but hey, no harm, they're allowed to go back about their business. Well, no, I don't agree with that. I think, first of all, human beings have a vastly higher cognitive capability than animals, and we're a lot better at uh, assessing the nature of other beings that are interacting with us. Now, granted, these um, aliens, let's call them that, are probably operating at a much higher cognitive level than we are, and we may not be able fully to understand everything, but we have we have our own not trivial capabilities of trying to apply the process of reason to these phenomena. And when you are dealing with a widespread covert program that is dealing with millions of people and taking them without their permission and doing things to them, often in a state of terror and also physical pain and agony uh, in a number of these cases, and you really have to wonder. And then on top of that, why does this involve such a massive presence in our world, a massive covert presence in our world? So I think these are factors that we need to continue to come back to, to get a really good, accurate, realistic handle on alien abduction and uh, its relationship to the UFO phenomenon in general. And again, not here to say that aliens, uh, alien abduction uh, explains all UFO activity. I don't believe that it does, but I do believe it is probably the most important component to understanding the behavior of UFOs that we will ordinarily, that we'll just see in the course of our uh, life. You know, if you're lucky, you want to put it that way, you can see a UFO or two in your life. I've had a couple of sightings that um, were interesting to me and they were not by any means the most dramatic that I've ever learned about. I've talked to lots of people who've had far more dramatic sightings than, than I have. But uh, if you if you look, if you're observant over time, it's a good chance you'll see something as well. That's interesting. Um, that definitely is the case. Okay, well, that's all I've got for you here. I hope that you find this interesting. Uh, to me, I think it's important that uh, you know UFO research does everything that it can do in order to analyze this phenomenon in ways that really help us to understand what's going on. 
uh, you know, it's one thing to say there's a cover up. There's obviously a cover up or a conspiracy. Yes, don't be afraid of that word. Secrecy about UFOs within the governments of the world, without a doubt. But it's important for us, I think, as researchers and students of this phenomenon to keep our eyes on the prize. And that means trying to understand what they are doing, what they are all about. And to do that, we need to get a handle on basic uh, statistics, you know, how many of them are there, where are they, what are they doing, and so forth. And then to do our best to extrapolate some scenarios on the basis of that. So that's what I try to do here. I hope you found it uh, helpful. With that, I will take my leave and I will definitely look forward to seeing you all again soon. In the meantime, oh, by the way, I wanna thank everyone who was here in the chat room, uh, the, the chat family. Happy to see you all here. Thank you for your support for Super Chats. Uh, your support means a lot to me uh, and to my wife, Tracy. We're very grateful for your support. Uh, if you do like what I've got going on here on this channel, by all means, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, get on, get notifications so you don't miss any new presentations that I have here. And if you really like what I do, please, by all means, do go check out my website, richarddolanmembers.com. Uh, I've got lots of free content there. I've got lots of member content there. By all means, go check it out. We're doing, um, in the process of a, a nice overhaul of the site. I've redesigned the menu system. Oh my God, long overdue, making it much more uh, navigable. And we've got other things happening there as well to make it a really positive experience. So there you go. Thank you for your um, support and I'll catch you all again soon. Let's keep our chin up and let's keep fighting a good fight. Later.